Matthew chapter 14, verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. So now, Herod has heard about Jesus' growing fame in the country, all about the miracles that Jesus has been performing. Some thought of Jesus as the return of Elijah or one of the prophets of old. See Mark 6, 15. Herod, though, was convinced that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Herod was sure that John's return from the afterlife in the form of Jesus was gave, is what gave him miraculous powers. Herod's superstition was driven by his own guilt because he is the one who had John the Baptist's head cut off. Matthew 14, 3 to 8. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother's Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. For when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Herod's birthday was kept. The daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. So Herod has already arrested and imprisoned John inside his fortress, Mark 6, 17. He would not go so far as kill John the Baptist, however, because of his duty to keep the peace in his part of Israel, many people in Israel believed John was a prophet sent from God. Herodias tells the girl exactly what to ask Herod for, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. She puts the gruesome request in the mouth of the girl, forcing Herod to either dishonor himself before his guests or have John executed and risk the disfavor of the people. Matthew 14 19 through 17. I'm sorry, 9 through 17. The king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake and them which sat with him at meat. He commanded it to be given her, and he sent and beheaded John in the prison. His head was brought in a charger given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. The disciples came and took up the body, buried it, and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him out on foot of the cities. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with, compa with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is the desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. So again, this is not just merely a large gathering. The total number of men, women, and children in this space could have been as much as fifteen to 20,000 people. The disciples have only enough food for themselves to eat. Beyond that, at best, they've located five loaves of bread and two fish. These were acquired by Andrew, who received the donation from a boy in the crowd. See John 6, 8 through 9. That would make for a meager meal, even if no other people were with them, let alone 20,000 people. Matthew 14, 18 and 19. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves, the two fishes, Looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. So here, Jesus takes the bread and the fish and he creates some order. He tells everybody to sit down on the grass. He looks up to heaven in the direction of God the Father and says a blessing. Then Jesus breaks the loaves in the customary way of sharing the bread 
and gives broken pieces to the disciples to distribute to the crowds. The disciples do exactly that as instructed. They begin to feed the mass of people. As it turns out, they not only finish feeding the people, they must be careful not to waste the leftovers. Here we will read in verse 20 to 25. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. They that had eaten were about five thousand men, besides the women and children. Straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now in the Roman world, night watches were divided into four periods, with the final one being between the hours we call 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. This means the disciples have been in the boat battling a strong wind for most of the night. They are somewhere in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and likely worn out. This condition is not their fault in a sense that they've made some kind of a mistake. They're here because Jesus explicitly ordered them to take the boat across the lake at that time. Verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. So here, one would expect the men cried out in fear because the figure approaching them was a ghost. In Jewish theology, mostly did not allow for ghosts, but many, many people in the ancient world believed in them. They certainly did not have another explanation for a figure walking toward them on the water until Jesus spoke to them in verses 27 to 30. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink, and he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now at some point, between leaving the boat and making it to Jesus' side, Peter, human doubt, seems to catch up with his enthusiastic faith. He suddenly noticed the ferocious wind, the size of the waves, and fear takes over his faith. And when you're trying to walk on water, there's no margin of error. Peter begins to sink, crying out to Jesus to save him. It's essential to notice that Peter's total confidence in the power of Jesus allowed him to walk on the water for a short time as Jesus did. It was fear replacing confidence which caused him to sink or fear replacing faith. Verse 31, <clears throat> And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? Peter's fear took over his faith. This will be a foreshadow of how it will happen again right before the crucifixion. Fear was the point of weakness that kept him from continuing to trust Jesus to give him the power to do the impossible. Jesus' response seems harsh, but it pointed a bright light on what Peter needed to recognize. Faith in Jesus makes anything possible, but fear kills faith. Matthew 14, 32 to 36. And when, they, and when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Let's read that, and we'll wrap this up. 
Isaiah 35, 5, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Verse 6, Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Matthew 14, 36, And besought him that might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many touched were made perfectly whole. So Jesus agrees, everyone who touches his garment is made well, perfectly whole, as was the case with the woman. These people are displaying great faith in Jesus' power to make them whole. Jesus' fame and stature continues to grow. In turn, the Pharisees, hold on, I declined that call. The Pharisees will set, step up their attempts to take Jesus down. Potters, stay in the Word.